Welcome to the Daily Office Lectionary. I'm Father Reed. This week, we're going to look at the third Sunday in Lent, the week of Third Lent, the third week in Lent in which we are preparing ourselves for the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. This is a time of fasting and prayer and reflection. Uh, many people in the Christian community over the centuries have used this time to evaluate their relationship with God, their relationship with Christ, uh, how they're doing in their spiritual life. And I'm so glad you could join us uh, as we look at the daily lectionary readings that are in your post. You can see them from Sunday to Saturday. And we suggest that you read these scriptures on a daily basis. You'll see Jeremiah, Romans, and John. And we will be in Jeremiah, Romans, and John in Lent and look at those scriptures. Now, as I go through the scriptures, I'm picking up scriptures that um, uh, point to some important truths in our Christian faith and practice. Obviously, as you read them uh, on a daily basis each day, you're going to learn a lot yourself. You might have a Bible that has, at the bottom of the page, commentary work on the scriptures. You may have a Bible that has notes to it. That is very helpful. Some of you may just enjoy the text as it is and can pray over the scriptures as we go through them together. Let's jump right in. Jeremiah chapter 6, 9 to 15. Now, the people, is for those of you that joined us for Second Lent, saw that Jeremiah is dealing with lots of problems with the people of God. They are not, they, the people of God, the Israelites are not doing what God says. And God is chastising them for that, 9 to 15. This is what the Lord Almighty says. This is verse 9. So he, he, the Lord, is speaking through Jeremiah the prophet. Let them glean the remnant of Israel as thoroughly as a vine. Pass your hand over the branches again, like one gathering grapes. To whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed. They cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. That is not a place you want to be. But we might have some in our audience like that. I'm glad you're listening or watching. Open your ears so that you can hear, not physically, but the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord should not be offensive. Now, I've said before that sometimes it is offensive because we don't want to hear it because we don't like to change. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. We don't like to admit that we are sinners. But it is a wonderful book that points out our sin. Are they ashamed of their loathful, loathsome conduct? Verse 15 of chapter 6. They have no shame at all. No. They don't even know how to blush. So, they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when I punish them, says the Lord. They're not even sorry. They're not even ashamed. There's no shame at all. Chapter 7. He says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim this message. So this is basically what he does. He is proclaiming a message for the people to hear so the people will not be judged or condemned by the Lord in a negative way. He's trying to avoid that. So it's incumbent upon him to say the message and for the people to respond in faith to the message that Jeremiah is sharing. He says, if you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, verse 5, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, verse 7, then I will let you live in this place in the land I gave your forefathers forever and ever. Then he says, in 9, will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, the temple, which bears my name and says, we are safe, we are safe to do all these detestable things. Now let's look at verse 11. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I've been watching, declares the Lord. I've been watching you. <laughs> He's watching. He's watching what we're doing every day. And he's watching our witness and what we say and what we do. 
that is important to consider and to remember. We continue on in chapter 7. I gave them this command, verse 23, Obey me, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Walk in all my ways, I command you, that it may go well with you. You want things to go well with you? Do what God says. It's simple. Obey him. Do what he says. But they would not listen or pay attention. That's unbelievable, isn't it? They followed their stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. They went backward and not forward. How do you go forward? Do what God says. How do you go backward? Don't do what God says. He says in 28, Therefore say to them, This is the nation that has not obeyed the Lord its God or responded to correction. Truth has perished. It has vanished from their lips. Now once truth goes away, you've got a serious, serious problem. Enjoy reading chapter 6 and chapter 7. Chapter 8. Chapter 8. Verses 18 through 9, 6. 18 through 9, 6. The harvest is past, verse 20. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. We are not saved. Verse 3 of chapter 9. They make ready their tongue like a bow to shoot lies. It is not by truth that they triumph in the land. They go from one sin to another. They do not acknowledge me. So God is telling us what he wants us to do in order to go forward and not backward. And also he's saying to the prophet, this is what they're doing. This is what they're doing. You live in the midst of deception. In their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me. Chapter 10. Now, You'll see, you notice in the daily lectionary, they're not covering entire chapters. So, you know, if you want to read more, obviously do that. Chapter 10, 11 to 24. God made the earth by his power. Verse 12. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. God is the creator. God is the one that is supplied. Verse 23, this is Jeremiah praying, I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It is not for a man to direct its steps. Correct me, Lord, but only with justice, not in your anger, lest you reduce me to nothing. Chapter 11, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Listen to the terms of the covenant. Tell them to the people of Judah and to those who live in Jerusalem. Tell them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Cursed, cursed is the man the woman who does not obey the terms of the covenant, the terms I commanded your forefathers when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting furnace. I said, obey me and do everything I command you, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. Then I will fulfill the oath I swore to your forefathers, forefathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, the land you possess today. Obey me. Do everything I command. If you do that, then you'll enjoy the land, and I will bless you. Finally, chapter 13, 1 through 11. Chapter 12 is good, by the way. This is what, what the word of the Lord said to me. Go and buy a linen belt, put it around your waist, but don't let it touch water. So I bought a belt. The Lord, As the Lord directed, I put it around my waist. Then the word of the Lord came to me a second time. Take the belt you bought and are wearing, go down to Parath, and hide it in the crevice in the rocks. So I did that. Many days later, the Lord said, go down to Parath and get the belt I told you to hide. So he went down, he dug it up, but it was ruined and completely useless. Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord says. In the same way, I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. These wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who follow the stubbornness of their hearts and go after other gods to serve and worship them, will be like this belt, completely useless. He says at the end of chapter 13, verse 11, they have not listened. God has spoken. They have not listened to what he said. Romans chapter 4. Romans. Read Romans slowly as you read Jeremiah slowly. He's talking about Abraham being justified by faith. The fourth chapter is a very important chapter about faith and about putting our faith in the Lord and not relying on the law. 
So as you read through that very beautiful text about trusting in the Lord, strengthening your faith, giving glory to God, believing. Verse 24, to whom God will give credit, will credit righteousness. For him, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Jesus was delivered over for death. This is 425, a great verse, for our sins. So he died on the cross to take care of our sins, and his resurrection had something to do with our justification. And our justification is everything to do with Jesus taking on our sins and imputing and giving to us. Now, imputing means we don't get his righteousness because we are good or we merit it or we earn it. We get it because out of his great mercy and grace and love for us, he gives it to us. And now we are justified before God. We are saved. We are going to heaven. We are in the kingdom of God. Chapter 5 is extraordinary, and chapter 6 is extraordinary. I simply don't have enough time to go through it all, but I'll share some great scriptures with you. 5 and 6, 4, 5, and 6, fantastic. Therefore, chapter 5, verse 1, since we have been justified through faith, our trust in Jesus, through our faith in Jesus. Got to have faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you have peace today. I hope you have peace. I hope you have peace with God. That peace is taken care of through Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access, verse 2, by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Hope does not disappoint us, verse 5 because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. God demonstrates his love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much he loved us. So there's a great love component in the scriptures. There's a great love component by God in the scriptures that Jesus Christ, his only son, dies for us while we were still sinners. We didn't get any better. Still great sinners. Now, chapter 5, 12 to 21 is an extraordinary series of verses regarding what happened in Adam and what happened in Christ. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, because of sin, death comes, and in this way, death came to all men because of all sin. So Adam, in his disobedience in Genesis 3, caused a tremendous break in our relationship with God. Sin entered the world. And in everyone's life, original sin is present. Sin is present. And death is present to us all because of sin. Okay? Now, he says, if the trespass of the one man, for by the trespass of the one man, verse 17, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So what happened was, because of what Adam did, all fell. Because of what Christ did, those who put their Christ, their faith in Christ will have righteousness and therefore be saved. One man caused death. One man brings life. In Adam, in Christ. You want to be in Christ. You don't want to be in Adam. You want to be born again, John chapter 3. Consequently, verse 18, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, Adam's sin, so the result of one act of righteousness, Jesus, was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, verse 19, so also the obedience of the one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. So that's why Christ is so important. And that's why your relationship with Christ is so important. Because he's the only one through whom righteousness can reign and justification which brings eternal life. Finally, verse 20 and 21. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that, so grace is greater than sin. If sin was greater than grace, we'd all be doomed. So that, just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness 
to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Just as sin reigned in death, so grace, the grace of God in Christ, might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life, and that's what we all want, eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's the only way to get eternal life, through Jesus. Chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? No, we died to sin. We are now called to live a new life, verse 4. We should no longer be slaves to sin, verse 6. In the same way, verse 11, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. So instead of offering yourself as an instrument of wickedness, offer yourself to God as an instrument of righteousness. Sin shall not be your master, verse 14. You are not under law, but under grace. The famous 23rd verse of chapter 6. The wages of sin is death. What I get from God in payback for my sin is death, eternal death. But the gift of God, God's gift, unmerited, unearned, can't work for it, can't buy it, is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the key to salvation. He's the key to salvation because he's the only person that can solve the sin problem. The sin problem that all of us have. The sin problem that brings death, not only to our bodies, but eternal death. Someone's got to solve the sin problem. That's the problem that we all have. Somebody's got to solve it. Somebody has solved it. That solution is in Christ. This is why these reading of these scriptures are so important in Jeremiah and in Romans. And now we look at John. John chapter 7. I hope that you have a wonderful week of reading. John chapter 7, 14 to 36. You'll find that in your post. Jesus says, Verse 18, he who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself. But he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There's nothing false about him. Jesus is not working on his own. He's working for his father. He trusts his father. He is working for his father. Remember we said last week, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. They tried to seize him in verse 30 of chapter 7. But no one laid on hands on him because his time had not yet come. Jesus is in total control of this whole process. <clears throat> they weren't going to kill him until he was ready. There's no way that was going to happen. Still, many in the crowd put their faith in him. When the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? And the Pharisees were whispering. So we have, again, as I said last week, we have the Jewish people. We have the Pharisees. We have this conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees and many of these chapters in John. We have the onlookers. We have the Jewish people trying to figure out who's right, who's wrong, who do they believe, what do they believe about Jesus. Verse 37, if a person is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water from, will throw flow from within him. We saw that in John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. So the, the Spirit of God is going to do a great work. And the Jewish leaders at the end of chapter 7 do not believe. They replied, are you from Galilee? Look into it, you'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Wow. 8, 12. Jesus spoke to the people, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Would you rather see where you're going, or would you rather be in darkness all the time? If you are in Christ and following Christ, you are walking in the light. Verse 23 of chapter 8. You are from above. Uh, below, I'm sorry, I am from above. Jesus is from above, we are from below. You are of this world, I'm not of this world. 
he says to the Jewish people. The Jewish leaders. The Pharisees are challenging him in verse 13. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe I'm the one that I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Remember I've told you, you must repent of your sins. You must put your faith in Christ. That's how you get saved. If you stay in your sins and you do not believe in Christ, you will die in your sins. I don't want that to happen for anyone. Jesus said in verse 26, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable, and what I've heard him from him I tell the world. I am getting a message from God the Father. I am sharing it with you. The information that I'm sharing with you is true. I know you have a hard time believing that it is true, but it is true. If you hold to my teachings, he says in verse 31, you are really my disciples, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, the, you know, a lot of people use that phrase, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. The, the truth is Jesus and his word, the gospel. That's the truth, okay? He says in verse 36, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. He says in verse 40, as it is, you're determined to kill me, a person who's told you the truth that I've heard from God. I heard this from God, I'm telling you the truth. Jeremiah, I heard this from God, I'm telling you the truth. Paul, I heard this from God, I'm telling you the truth. These three people are bringing a message of truth from the Lord for us to hear and obey and respond to. Finally, in chapter 8, He who belongs to God hears what God says, verse 47. I pray that's all of us again. He who belongs to God hears what God says, that you are hearing the word of the Lord as you work through these scriptures on a daily basis in the daily lectionary. And as you are listening to the Lord in this season of Lent, as you're listening to the Lord and preparing yourself for the coming of the Lord. He says in verse 51, I tell you the truth, if a person keeps my word, he will never see death. Oh, you and I are going to die, but we're not going to die eternally. Jesus said in verse 58, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. Now this was very offensive. They picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. They wanted to kill him. They couldn't hear his word. It's offensive. They do not believe that before Abraham was born, which would have been 1800 years before, 1800, that Jesus was present. They had no idea our conception that this person could be the Son of God. Well, may you have a, a blessed Lent and a blessed time of reading these scriptures. May God work in your heart and mind so that we can hear the Word of God, believe it, and put it into practice. God bless you.